Well, it is good to see you this morning. It's good to be back. I love home. We, uh, we've been traveling through Greece and Turkey and uh, exploring the, uh, the uh, development of the church in the New Testament. We left Istanbul 3 a.m. Friday morning. Not exactly sure when we got back. Not exactly sure what time it is. Well, been awake since 4 a.m. Woke up to a normal dream. You know, I was riding my pet elephant through Caldwell. And one of Nebuchadnezzar's lions were attacking a girl. My elephant, because that's the way my elephant is, stepped on the lion, rescued the girl, got her into her orange dots and pickup, and I woke up. Normal stuff. And I laid there and tried to go back to sleep and realized it was, you know, not worth it. So I'm not exactly um, responsible for what happens in the next hour, but I'm going to do my best. Um, I, I, I want to give you a little bit of a, um, in a nutshell, kind of a, an overview of, of what we've been doing in these past two weeks. We, we've been uh, at 40 different sites throughout Greece and Turkey, um, 17 or 18 days, can't remember, of travel time. We covered 2,500 miles by bus plus boat plus flying plus walking. Um, for those of you who, who think it was a vacation, it, it, was, it, it, there wasn't, it, was, it was breakneck to get all of that in in that amount of time. But it was amazing to see the land that Paul took the gospel to. Um, I tell you what, I have this amazing appreciation for the Apostle Paul like I've never had before. Uh, when I realized he did this three times through that land, and he wrote all of these letters to these churches, I think he started 23 churches. Um, he was a tent maker, and I don't know how he got it all done. Ron, I was just looking back at you. I don't know if you've ever studied the leadership principles of Paul and how he accomplished all he did, but... I tell you what, brother, I, we need to talk. I, can't, I don't understand, apart from the strength of God, how he got done what he got done. But we were able to experience some amazing things. We, we traveled this, this, this land. We started in, in Athens, Greece, and we moved on up into some of the, uh, the churches that Paul uh, planted and then crossed over into the Asian continent uh, and into Turkey came down and hit the seven churches of Revelation uh, and then wound up in Istanbul finally. Um, it, was, uh, it was a lot of a, a travel, but it was an amazing experience to see the sights that we did to, see, to walk the land where Paul was in Athens, to be on Mars Hill where he reasoned with the philosophers of the day. The Temple of Zeus that was so prominent in Athens at the time he was there. And how many temples that you see still standing today. And, and this is just a fraction of that which has been uncovered. There's so much more there. But the land is, is filled with, well, the whole place is in ruins. Um, it, <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke. It's, I guess he's, it's all about timing, I guess. Uh, yeah. Anyways, um, there's temples everywhere. Everywhere you look, there are marble pillars, marble platforms. The land is filled with gods in the plural. And Paul was taking the gospel to people who had no biblical background. They didn't have the land of Israel. We've been talking about the land of Israel, how it speaks. Israel is easy to take a group to. Because you get there, you read the passage that happened there, and everybody in the group goes, oh, you don't need a preacher to preach it to you. It makes sense. You go there, you have to archaeologically dig out what Paul was doing. And so he did something different, and yet something similar to what Jesus did. Jesus spent 85 to 90% of his time in the righteous triangle of, of, of Chorazim, Bethsaida, and... and uh, um, Capernaum, thank you. That's th that little area of, of space, 85 to 90% of his time. And so Jesus used analogies that made sense to the people. Planting, uh, uh, birds and, and flowers and fishing. 
Paul didn't use those analogies. He used what made sense to the people of the land. And what made sense to them was buildings, temples, building blocks, foundations, marble, engravings. All of this made sense to them. We got into the land of Corinth. There's so much there. I mean, it's going to take a long time to unpack this. I'm just giving you an overview this morning. To Berea, where, where the Christians were, were, were taking the Scripture, taking the, the, the passage that, that Paul would speak on, and they would go back and search the Scriptures themselves to make sure Paul was telling the truth. That's great. That's what the church needs to continue to do. We don't need to take... Uh, the preacher's words f for granted, assuming that he's saying everything true. Be students of the word. Find out. And, and being in Berea was, was, was a great experience there. Uh, in Philippi, it was amazing. This is, so much history took place here. We may get into Philippians this summer. I'm not sure yet, but um, so much happened here. Uh, it's mentioned throughout Romans and, and other places, but it's also, of course, the book uh, also Acts, but then we have the book of Philippians. But so much happened here. This is where Lydia um, was saved. In fact, I was down by the water and I found her. <laughs> and I led her to the Lord and I baptized her right there on the spot. It was great. Yeah. Um, but it, powerful. And um, it, one of these days, Dory's going to unpack some of this. Uh, this is a powerful moment for her to be right there on those waters. Then we crossed into Turkey. And uh, uh, the Roman road uh, where Paul walked is still many sections of it that are just left uncovered. You can just go stand on the very stones he walked. Um, it, I didn't realize that Greece was one of the most mountainous countries in the world. I, I seriously don't know how Paul did it. We had a bus. He walked. He rode boats. Pergamum was an amazing site. There's so much there to unpack. We were in the, the city of Sardis. The, Sardis was an amazing place. This is one of the churches of, the, uh, of Revelation. And, and uh, you go back and you read about the church of Sardis, and it'll begin to make sense. You see, this is the temple of Diana here, um, and, and Artemis Diana. And right connected to it, you'll see that little brick building. That's a church. Now, granted, the church was built about 300, but the question is this, were they connected to the temple because they were trying to be a witness to the world, or were they connected to the temple because they didn't see the difference between being the church and being a part of the temple? Because in the same community, you'll find the synagogue, which is adjoining, has adjoining walls to the gymnasium. And the gymnasium is where the athletes would work out. And can I just say, they didn't work out with clothes on. And if you were coming to synagogue, you would walk out and see all of this. The question again, were they trying to be connected to the world so they could influence the world? Or had they become so connected and enmeshed with the world that they didn't see a problem with being of the world? You can go back and read about the church of Sardis. And we went to the island of Patmos where John, the revelator, received the revelation that we studied last year. Um, a very inspiring place, a wonderful place. I wish we could have spent more time there. Ephesus. Many of you who have not explored all of this area have done cruise ships, and cruise ships are notorious for bringing people to Ephesus. There's a lot of money to be made there from tourists. It's one of the most remarkable sites there. A lot has been uncovered, and, and there will be more to share in the days ahead that give us insights into the early church and, and what they faced and how they um, uh, did what they did. Um, but Ephesus was an amazing place because this is a, a place that also had the temple of Diana or Artemis. And uh, it was here um, that, that Paul got himself into trouble. Um, you see, there... There is uh, um, extra-biblical text, letters written by leaders of the time, explaining the fact that since this Christian movement began, there's less and less people coming to the temples, and there's less and less people buying gods. Christianity was having a negative influence on the economy of paganism. Um, and so it was here in Ephesus at this amphitheater 
where Paul almost lost his life. The riot uh, happened and he was rescued. Then we went up into the area of Heropolis, only mentioned once in the Bible, I believe. I want to say it's Colossians 4, or I think it's Colossians, I can't remember. I, I'm doing good to be standing here right now, so, you know, <laughs> if I misquote scripture, please don't come correct me afterwards. You can just, just realize that at least I'm in the Bible, you know, so... <laughs> So Heropolis is this amazing place where all of these hot waters are emerging from the center of the earth, hot healing mineral baths. It's not, it's, it's not, um, uh, it's not sulfur, it, uh, so it doesn't smell. It, it, it's, it's, uh, people still flock there to just bathe in its waters. And so it was known, for even centuries ago, when, when the letter was written 2,000 years ago, that, that this was a place where people went for healing. Um, so you just look down in the valley, across that valley, you come to the city of Laodicea. Laodicea is being uncovered currently, even as we speak, archaeologically. But this is the place that if you look from the place that I'm taking this picture, you can see the mountain of Heropolis and the white cliffs that you just saw. But you can also look to the south and see the hill, which is, was the city of Colossae. Colossae was known for a different kind of water. Colossae was known for a cold, clear, refreshing water that came off the mountains right behind it. So when you go to Revelation and you read about the story of Laodicea, Jesus says to the church, he says, you are neither hot nor cold. In other words, you, 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 you have, as you are called of God, um, as someone who, who contains the presence of God, to be, um, uh, to be a minister to others. And, and therefore, your life needs to either have the healing properties of hot water, or it needs to have the cold, refreshing properties of a cup of cold water of encouragement. Either be a healer or be an encourager. And Jesus says, but you're neither. You're not hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But because you're neither, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth powerful lesson as you stand there in Laodicea and see that. This is a very godly land. When I say godly, I say that tongue-in-cheek, in parentheses, small g. Gods abound everywhere. I'm not going to get all my gods right here, so don't worry about it, but we have goddesses, and we have gods, and we have, here's Artemis. You're going to see many different versions of her. Zeus, and somebody said, Jim, this, this next one really has a, a strange likeness to you, so I took a picture of it. <laughs> I thought, yeah, it does. It's weird how, what you find when you're traveling. Um, but uh, these were very godly people. And, and, and Paul is in the midst of this culture that is filled with temples and buildings and gods and goddesses. And he's trying to bring the gospel to them. And it reminds me of the old adage when it comes to sharing the gospel, and this is something we could talk about in, in the class, the message must remain the same, but the methods must change. So whoever you are, wherever you live, the way you say the gospel is going to be different than the way another person says it because you're going to use language that everybody there understands. And Paul knew that they understood temples. They understood gods who live in marble dwellings. For, for instance, Romans chapter 9, verse 32, Paul is talking about the church, uh, the Jews. And he's talking about the fact that they, they didn't get it. In verse 32, he says, Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have what? Stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Who is that? It's Jesus. Jesus has been called both the cornerstone and the stumbling stone. He is the cornerstone on which you build the foundation, on which the temple is built. Not the physical temple, but the temple of the Holy Spirit, us. Or he becomes a stumbling stone. What does that mean? The Jews, some of the Jews, had their religion all figured out. They had God in a box. They had God contained 
on a chain, so to speak. They had figured out how to tame God and make money off of him. They had power. They had money. Jesus comes along and throws that whole thing into a tizzy, and he became offensive to them because he said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So, so they figured out real soon that, that they either had to try and go around Jesus to get back to the God that they had created. Somebody said one time that God created us in his image, and we've been trying to recreate his, him in our image ever since. They had created God in their image, and so they had to go around Jesus, and when they kept falling over him, they finally decided the only way to solve this was to kill him. Well, of course, that didn't work, did it? So he's a stumbling stock block. He's a, he, he is a foundation stone, cornerstone. So we get into Corinth. I was in, uh, in the city of Corinth. About 10 years ago, this part, the, uh, the lower part of the city was uncovered. You'll, you'll, you'll meet a man in the Bible three times in the New Testament named Erastus. Erastus was one of the leaders of Corinth. He was a very wealthy man. We know this based on, on um, extra-biblical text, um, historical text, telling us about the, the history of Corinth. We read about a man named Erastus. But Paul, apparently, he gets, well, he does. He gets saved, and he becomes a partner with Paul in the ministry. And here, um, about 10 years ago, they uncovered this thing that everybody's standing in front of, and it is the foundation of a building. And those words imprinted there in, in Greek are, Erastus laid this foundation at his own expense. When you're a wealthy person, you build buildings and you put your name on them. Still happens, doesn't it? Well, probably about the time Erastus was building this building and putting his name on this, he didn't know Jesus yet. And he had this, this dream that this building would last forever and everybody would know his name. Little did he know that 2,000 years later, we would discover it under a huge pile of dirt. You see, buildings don't last. Temples don't last. And what Paul used was these building blocks to clearly demonstrate that the real temple is us. Take a look at 1 Corinthians, would you? Um, chapter 3, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. Before I, before I get there... Um, I was looking earlier at the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and it's Paul explaining all that he went through to preach the gospel. And it talks about the times he was beat, um, five times by the Jews, 39 lashes, um, wrecked at sea, adrift at sea, um, so poor he didn't have enough clothes to keep him warm, so hungry he thought he was going to die, imprisoned countless times. Stoned once to the point of death, but survived. And, and, he, and he goes into all of this and he says, and, he says and, and why did I do all this? Because I had this burden for the church. And, and I, I, I think as I was standing there and standing in this land and realizing how hard he worked to try and bring the gospel into a language that they could get. And the burden that he had for the church, I realized that that verse when he says, for me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He really meant it. <laughs> In other words, if I'm going to live, every breath I've got is going to be for Jesus. But frankly, if I get to die today, I'm all for it. And I've, I felt the, the, the weight and the truth of that verse more than ever before as I stood there and saw what Paul went through to communicate the gospel and what he was up against. So 1 Corinthians, he, he's dealing with the church here who is, they love Christ, they, they want to be followers of Jesus, and yet they've grown up in this pagan religion. And they're trying to figure out a way to, to survive as Christians in the midst of paganism. And so sometimes they, they dip a little bit back into the paganism and try and join it with, with Christianity. And sometimes they just throw up their hands and just kind of become Christian pagans. And, and Paul is trying to help them learn how to walk with Christ in the midst of paganism. 
warning them full on that it's going to be costly. Chapter 3, verse 9, the church is arguing over which preacher they like better, Apollos or him. Apparently, Paul wasn't spectacular at preaching. All the, all the information that we have, again, extra biblical text and all this, all the words that we have about Paul. But Apollos apparently was pretty amazing, eloquent, great communicator. And so, so people were, were dividing. They're, they're dividing over their favorite preacher, their favorite pastor, competition. Okay, preachers die. My favorite pastor, preacher, died. I love the way he preached. My pastor growing up, I love the way he preached. Still to this day, I think that there's probably some of him that, that has influenced the way I do it because I just, I, I, I just, but he had the nerve to die. And then I find myself talking about him, and people go, I've never heard of him. What? You've never heard of him? He changed my life. I think, okay, I see how it happens. And Paul's saying, quit that. Stop it. Don't argue. He says here, verse 9, chapter 3, we're both God's workers. You're God's field. You're God's building. Listen to how many times he uses the word building and temple here. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Boom. That's not in there. I just added that. <laughs> Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. All of these things, they make sense to these Corinthians. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, build, that builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but, met, but like someone barely escaping through the wall of flames. Don't, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God don't you, don't you get it? It's not buildings. God doesn't dwell in it. He dwells in you. You're the temple. That's what he's saying. And the Spirit of God lives in you. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. When I, when I walked this land, I realized it was inundated with temples, and Paul uses that to say, you are the temple. You are the dwelling place of God. That's where God chooses to reside, not in some stone facade, but in human flesh, your life and mine. That's what he means. So I think about Erastus. I don't think that once Erastus became a believer, he really cared that he had built that building. But prior to that, that's what mattered. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how easily we get, we get distracted by what we think is going to last, and it doesn't last. What really lasts are the things that are built on the foundation that is Christ Jesus. If the preacher preaches eloquently and he entertains, but he doesn't point people to Jesus, he's wasting people's time. That's good preaching right there. I, Because preachers die, they, they, get, they, they leave. And if Jesus doesn't come back, so is this one. But that which lasts is, is that which is done that points people to Jesus and helps them lock into the idea that he wants to live in us. That's what it's all about. That's what Paul's saying. That's the stuff that lasts. That's the stuff that will, test, will stand the test of fire. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul talks again about, uh, about people being carved in God, uh, permanence. He, he uses this word, clearly you are a letter from Christ, showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with pen and ink. In other words, not on paper, not something that's going to blow away, not something that's going to disintegrate. 
But with the spirit of the living God, it is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. That's what lasts. That's what lasts. It's not, it's not the carvings that you see uh, there that, that, that praise the person who built the building. You, someday I'll show you a, a, um, this beautiful temple put together by several rich people in Ephesus. They have all their names on it. Nobody knows who they are or where they are anymore. We don't know nothing about them, but we know their names. Big deal. Paul's saying, God is carving, your, carving his name on your heart. That's what lasts. That's what matters. And then chapter 6 of, of 2 Corinthians. He, he's, he's talking more here about the temple of the living God. Verse 14, he says, don't, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. No, let, me, let me just say something here. This, some of you have a translation that says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And we pastors are famous for sitting down with young couples who want to be married, and we explain this to them. Do not marry someone who does not share your faith. That's good counsel. That's good counsel. But that's not all what this passage means. And you're gonna, you're gonna, we're going to read on here, and it's going to sound like this, is, this is, means you should stay away from the world altogether. But, but, but let, me, let me read it. Let me, let me explain it. Don't, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can a righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? Uh, for we are what? The temple of the living God. And God said, I'll, I'll live among them and walk among them. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you and I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I've always heard this verse as, as a way of, of explaining why we should not have any contact with the world. The problem with that is that flies in the very face of what Jesus told us to be and that is salt and light. How in the world are we going to bring out the God flavors in life if we're not coming out of the salt shaker and into the world? How will the darkness be exposed unless the light that is shining through our lives enters into that darkness? And Jesus' prayer in John 17 was, Lord, I pray that you not take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. So is Paul saying something different than Jesus or do we need to understand the context? Yes, we need to understand the context. Here's the problem. Corinth was trying to combine paganism with Christianity. I like Jesus. He's cool. But I really like the culture's view of sexuality. So I want to integrate that. And I really like the culture's view on... on uh, on, on finances and wealth. I like this, this idea that if you're in Christ, you'll get richer. I like that, so I'm going to bring that in. Oh, and I, I like the values and morals of culture here, so I'm, I'm going to try. I mean, I like Jesus, don't get me wrong, but I, I really don't want to separate paganism from walking with Jesus. And Paul's saying, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus and the devil don't play together well. You can't mesh them for convenience sake. Be in the world, but not of it. If you're not in it, there's no salt. There's no light. But remember, Lot's wife, who looked back, she was salt. Being salt means you love the people, not the culture. Becoming a pillar of salt means you love the culture, not the people. Did you get that? That's the context of Corinthians. 
And Paul pulled his hair out over this church and her constant desire to kind of serve Jesus and bring in paganism too. And he said it, how did, how, did he, how did he explain himself? You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're it. God could choose to live anywhere. <laughs> and guess what? He picked you. He wants to live in you. You. Yes, you, me. Why? Ephesians chapter 2. Take a look at that. Ephesians 2.19 here we are in Ephesus, man alive, talk about temples, edifices to gods and goddesses and emperors and emperors that wanted to be gods and things like that. Verse 19, chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul says, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners, you're citizens along with all of God's holy people. You're members of God's family, together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. There's his analogy again. We're carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. You see, as I walked this land, I saw that Paul used the buildings to explain the gospel. He made a lot of comparisons. He made comparisons between the culture of many gods versus serving the one true God and being the temple of his presence. Paul compared appeasing the gods. That's what you had to do in that culture. You had to basically keep gods at bay. You had to do things for them so they wouldn't kill you. It's called sympathetic magic, you know. Maybe if I, if I do something really nice for Jesus, he'll, he'll back off. That's not, that's not Christianity. That's paganism. Because he introduces this idea that God wants to live at the very center of our lives. He wants to occupy the space called our bodies. He wants to, to be the very center of who we are and, and what we think on a daily basis. He wants to be the very essence of, of, of who we are and how we live and how we move and how we have our being. He, he, wants, he wants to be our everything. Paul compared this idea of gods on the side dwelling in these, these, these earthen temples versus God who lives right in the midst and ever present in our lives. But he kept saying it time and time again, we are the temples. <sighs> I don't know about you, but when I think about that, I'm thinking God could have picked a nicer place to live than me. In fact, I'm, I'm quicker to tell you the reasons why I don't deserve his love than to tell you he's living in me. Sometimes I think maybe that's my way of making sure I'm humble. You know, I, I, oftentimes I, I think that I'm just this crusty old temple falling apart at the seams in ruins and he decides to live in me. And I, I've never really quite understood that. But I saw something in a, in a museum that I want to share with you that helped bring some things together for me. Um, go to, go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is, this is a verse that if you have been knocking around the church very long, you've probably heard. If you're new um, to the church, I want to share something that's pretty spectacularly amazing. Spectacularly, is that a word? It is now, I guess. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul's talking about us being the temple. He's talking about how God lives in us. Verse 7, chapter 4, he says, Now we have this light shining in our hearts. But we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great 
treasure. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. It's easy to see, well, it's obvious it's God in you because you're obviously not powerful. So my automatic thought is I am just a crusty old clay pot. He goes on to say, we're pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And I, I've always seen myself as a cracked clay pot. Sometimes maybe because I'm fairly critical of myself. Sometimes I disappoint me. And then we were in the museum. And uh, the scholar who was leading the trip said, I want you to look at something here. And he, he said, uh, I want you to see this. Oop, 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 oop. I want you to see this. This is a first century Pyxis. P-Y-X-I-S. Pyxis. Found in Athens. It's a beautiful piece. I actually looked this up on, on eBay to see if there's any available. I found one for $5,000. I'm not going to buy it. Because then I found this one in a store, and it's cheaper. So I bought it. It's only a year old, but, you know, it's still cool. I, I brought it here so you can see it. I put it under a glass jar because I paid a lot of money for it, and I don't want you to break it. Okay, good. <laughs> it's all hand-painted. It's beautiful. Let me, let, me, let me go backwards. Let me show you. In the be- look at the beauty of the hand-painting on that. It's all hand-painted. It's gorgeous. Look at this new one. Hand-painted. Still, the, the, the artistry of, of, uh, of that, that area is still still being used. I mean, they're still producing this kind of beautiful stuff. Um, Here's the challenge. You go back to the original Greek on verse 7 of chapter 4, and here's the order of the words. The order of the words, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, is this. Thesaurus ostrakios skeuos. See, I knew that would bless you. Okay, so let me, let me unpack that. Thesaurus, isn't this wonderful? The word thesaurus means a treasury of rich things, valuable things. If you're a writer, you know what a thesaurus is. If you're a college student, you really know what a thesaurus is. <laughs> yeah. But isn't that interesting? The Greek word for thesaurus is a treasury of, of valuable things. And then it says uh, thesaurus ostrichios, which is clay, is ostrichios, and then skeuos is, is, is container. So the order is different than what we've translated because we just sort of automatically assumed that we're, we're just old, crusty clay pots. But the order in which these words come is that, 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 that thesaurus is the qualifier for what kind of clay pot. This is a jewelry box. And what Paul was meaning when he used the words in that way, we're a pixis not an old clay pot. You're a jewelry box that has the very presence and power of God poured into it. Let that one simmer. You are a thing of beauty to the God who created you. Even before you recognized his love, you were worth dying for. Jan and Terry, I thought about you in Greece. Your ministry, broken pots. This still works. The pots are not ugly. They're not crusty. They're not, they're beautiful. Because God stores the most valuable thing to him in the things that are the most beautiful. Now, as I was there, I noticed uh, we were in a, in a pottery shop 
and I took a picture of this gal who's hand painting all of that amazing, amazing pottery, all by hand. Now, hand painting pottery cannot be done perfectly. It requires of the artist the ability to adapt to this asymmetrical surface of the object being painted and to do it in a beautiful way. So let me ask you a question. Why do we define beauty as symmetry? Scientists will tell you that, that we, we define beauty by symmetry. We, you, know, if, you know, if you look at me real close, you'll notice that not only do I have a gap in my teeth, but it's not lined up with my nose. <laughs> Which is why you find me ruggedly handsome. <laughs> Emphasis on rugged. <laughs> and what we find is that when we look at some of the people that are, you know, beautiful in the world, some who my daughter likes to say have won the genetic lottery. <laughs> Everything lines up. Ears, same shape. Eyes, same level. Nose, down the center. Lips, perfect. We call symmetry beautiful. But do you know that creation is not symmetrical? Creation is asymmetrical. Go out and study it. Look around this week. See what God has made and see if you see symmetry. You won't find it. And when God created this world, he stepped back and said what? It is good. Do you think God sees something that we don't? Do you think perhaps we measure perfection and beauty differently than God does? Now, because I was up at four in the morning dreaming about elephants in Caldwell, I noticed this picture. And besides the fact that I'm ADD, you know, um, I noticed these were not perfect. There, there's, 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 there's a problem here. In this original one from the, from the uh, 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 you know, found in the dirt in Athens, there's like two dots, one, you know, two dots, two, and then a row of one dots. They didn't do it right. They're missing dots. And I went, oh no. I got the picture of mine and I looked and look at what I found. There's red, there's black, there's red, there's black, there's red, there's black, there's red, there's red. What? <laughs> Mine's not perfect. I'm going to take it back. I paid good money for this. It's not symmetrical. Aren't those things ugly? Aren't those things inferior? No, they're beautiful. Because the artist made them that way. <clears throat> Were either one of these works scrapped? What sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it saying, Stop, you're doing it wrong. Does the pot exclaim, how clumsy can you be? And yet we do. We say, God, you made a mistake when you made me. Why did you do them right and me wrong? And God says, I don't do things wrong. I made you beautiful in my sight. You're not an old crusty pot. You're a pixis, a jewelry box. And I pour the most precious treasure this world has ever had into you, my Holy Spirit. <sighs> Sometimes we think it's humility when we tear ourselves down, when we point out our imperfections, we walk through life. I wonder if anybody else has noticed that I'm missing a row of dots. <laughs> I wonder if it's screamingly obvious to everybody that I should be black, red, black, red, black, red, but I'm actually black, red, black, red, red, red. I mean, I'm imperfect. I'm not made right. I must have been the end of the line on Friday afternoon when God wanted to go home. 
I'm, I'm flawed. Well, can I just say that, no, you're not. And God knew exactly what he was doing when he made you and that he poured his very presence into you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me ask you a question. Does it make sense what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth? Why would you want to take the very presence of Christ and blend it with the works of the devil? You were made beautiful. And then you're filled with the very presence of God. You're a pixis, not an old crusty bucket. And God lives in you. You can choose to live your life being self-critical. If you want to do that, you can do that. But how do I say this in a nice way, in a very Christian loving way? It's time to get over yourself. You're beautiful. And you're made just the way you're supposed to be. And then he fills you with his very presence. He knows what he's doing. Can you just relax with that? Let's stand. Isaiah 49 says these words, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. This hymn is a fitting way message and just praise and adoration of God. Bow your head with me as we bring our time to a close this morning. I get a sense, I sensed it last night, I sensed it this morning, that there are some who struggle with 
with hearing those words and believing that God sees you with value. That when God looks at you, he, he sees someone that's beautiful. He sees someone who he loves. He sees someone with great value. And I feel like maybe this morning we should just take a moment just where we are and let that truth sink in. Oh, it's beautiful that the Spirit of God wants to dwell within us and live within us and work through us out into the world. But if we miss that peace, that he looks at us and sees value in us, we miss so much. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak that to our hearts right now. Would you help us not to miss that in the busyness of what we have to do the rest of this day, the things that we have going on this week? May we not miss that you see beauty in us, imperfections and all. When you look at us, you don't see those imperfections as mistakes. You see those as unique characteristics and unique pieces of who we are. You, the artist who knit us together in our mother's womb and made us exactly perfect. Oh, we dwell on those things that keep us from you. We dwell on those things that keep us different and make us feel awkward. But Jesus, we pray, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us. Help us to believe that the way you see us is beautiful. Help us to believe that the way that you look at us has value. And Lord, thank you. Thank you that you indwell us. You live within us. Your spirit is at work within us. That we're not left as orphans just trying to figure this thing out. But that you walk with us. That you live within us. That you work within our hearts and within our lives. And so, Spirit of God, would you help us to make that journey from our head to our heart of that truth of that when you see us, you see beauty and you see worth and you see something worth dying for. So, God, for my friends, for my brothers and sisters, for everyone who finds himself here today or listening online, Father, may that truth be spoken clear and direct to our hearts that you find worth and value within us and that you love us. May our ears receive that truth today. May our heart respond to that truth. And we thank you for that indwelling spirit, Lord, who gives us the boldness to walk this stuff out. What we're hearing, Lord, becomes part of our lives, becomes the fabric of who we are because your spirit's at work within us and you help us to believe those things that we struggle to believe. So this week, God, would you empower us to believe that we are beautiful, that you did not make a mistake when you created us, that you love us and have a plan and a purpose for our life. May that truth sink in this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May you go in the power of the Spirit of God, believing that you are beautiful in His sight. God bless you.